Let's stand and sing. We're turning again to Psalm 25, and we're continuing our study in the Psalms through these winter months until the end of the year in the will of the Lord. And what we simply want to do is to read from verse number eight. And hear the truth of the Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. 
His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that thou will bless uh, this reading to our hearts. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy word. Lord, give us understanding today. Give us a heart that longs to hear thy truth and to be obedient to it. Lord, empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit, I pray. Give me help to deliver the word of God to the glory of thy name, for it's in Jesus' precious name may ask these things. Amen and amen. Last week, we were looking at the verse, good and upright, verse 8, is the Lord. Therefore, will he teach sinners in the way. And part of the goodness of the Lord and the uprightness of the Lord not only teaches sinners in the way and draws sinners onto salvation through the preaching of the gospel, but it goes on in verse 9 to say that the Lord will even go further than that. He doesn't just save the sinner, but in verse 10 or verse, verse number 9, it says, The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. And that word meek is a description of someone who is saved and is obviously in obedience to the Lord. The word meek literally means humble. Now, some people think that it means if you're meek, you're weak. But meekness is not weakness. It is a humble disposition and it is a humble spirit to obey God, to be faithful and to do his will. And therefore, we are called to be a meek people. The word meek in itself would tell us and teach us that it is a people who have been saved from a natural state of sin and pride. And whenever we read about meek people in the Bible, we read about blessed people in the Bible. And I want us to look at a few verses this morning, just before we even go down any further in this psalm, about the meek and the blessing of being a meek person. It is the meek that will seek the Lord. In fact, in Zephaniah 2, verse 3, it says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. And you know, for us to seek the Lord, there has to be a humbling of self. The day we were saved, we humbled ourselves before the Lord. We weren't proud or arrogant coming into his presence. We were humble, we were meek, we were like the publican in the temple who would not lift up so much as his eyes toward heaven because he was so ashamed of his sin. And we humble ourselves before God, repenting of our sin and calling on the Lord for mercy. And I urge you this morning, if you're not saved, humble yourself before God. Seek God. Now, you can't seek God with a proud, arrogant heart saying, well, you know, I'm not too bad. My life is okay, but I, I want to be saved. You must come before God acknowledging you're a sinner. You're deserving of hell. All your life has been an offense to a holy God because you've been living in sin against him. But praise God for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanseth from all sin. It is the humble that seek the covering of the blood. And therefore, I would urge you, if you're not saved this morning, to seek the Lord while he may be found to call upon him while he is near. You're in the book of Psalms. Turn back to Psalm number 10 and we'll find another uh, thing that is attributed to the meek. It says there in Psalm Sorry, go down. Yes, Psalm number uh, 10, verse 1. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in time of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in devices that they have imagined. For the Lord, or for the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in, his, in all his thoughts. His ways are grievous. Thy judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for his enemies, he puffeth at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. And the word of the Lord is teaching us here that the proud man is one who is trusting completely in 
himself. He is one who is demanding that all would be in obedience to him. I shall not be moved. I will do what I want to do and no one will cast me aside. However, the meek come to the Lord and realize that they have no power in and of themselves. They have no control over what happens in life. They have no ability to please God, but they humble themselves and they seek the Lord in prayer. The Lord hears the prayers and the desires of the humble. And look at verse number 12. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. And the word humble is the same word as the meek over there in Psalm 25. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 29. And Isaiah chapter 29, verse 19. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor men or the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. So we've seen that the meek seek the Lord. We've seen that the meek pray unto the Lord. Here's the third thing: the meek are those who will know the joy of the Lord, the increasing joy of the Lord. And here we see a very, very important lesson for the child of God to learn. If you will have joy in your walk with God, and joy as a Christian, and joy in this life, you must humble yourself. You will not increase in joy with pride in your heart. You will not increase in joy if you're going against the Lord, but if you humble yourself, and in obedience follow him, you will know the joy of obedience that the Lord bestows upon them who are faithful. Go back to Psalm 147. Psalm 147. And when we come to this chapter, it says in verse number 6, Psalm 147, verse 6, the Lord lifteth up the meek. Now we know that there are times we fall as believers, times we stumble and the Lord does lift us up. And of course, that is true. But what this verse is saying is something quite different. Because the word lifteth up, it means to testify or to be a witness for. And the reality is that it is the Lord who bears witness of his people. And we who have been saved by the grace of God, who have been brought home to glory, the Lord will stand for us on the day of judgment and testify for us and witness for us that we belong there, that we are saved, that we're washed in the blood, that we have been redeemed, that we are his people. And how wonderful it is even this morning to know that in heaven there is one who testifies for us, one who prays for us, one who pleads the promises of the book for us before his Father. And therefore, it is the meek that seek the Lord. It's the meek that pray unto the Lord. It's the meek who know the joy of the Lord. It's the meek whom the Lord testifies for. But coming back to our text this morning in Psalm 25, it is the meek whom the Lord guides and teaches. God will teach the meek. God will guide the meek. Now, as Christians, sin is often found in our lives, in thought and in word and in deed. But perhaps the most subtle of sins is the sin of pride. It goes unnoticed for so long. It doesn't bother us perhaps the way other sins would bother us. And yet it causes great problems in our lives. Pride is the opposite of meekness. What is pride? Well, the word pride, it means arrogance. It means to elate or to blow up oneself, to lift up yourself in your mind. We saw what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Whenever the temptation came, made in perfection, giving, given every blessing that God could have given to them, a place without sin, and yet pride entered into their heart. 
And that pride said, I know better than God. God said, thou shalt not eat of that particular tree. And they said, I know better than God. They said, I will go my own way rather than God's way. Their attitude was, well, we know best. We know it all. So we don't need to learn or listen to the word of God for our blessing. And friend, that's what pride says in our lives. Even in the Christian, when pride starts to enter and we get an elevated view of ourselves and we start to think of ourselves more than we really are, you know what happens? We start to say, I know better than God. We start to say, I will go my own way. We even start to say, I know it all, therefore I don't need to learn. And friend, that's a very dangerous position to be in when a Christian feels that they cannot learn from others. I remember years ago, when I was at Bible college, I remember asking someone if they were going to a particular uh, meeting that was being held, and lots of churches were invited to this meeting uh, somewhere far across the country, and a lot of churches were being invited to it. And the fellow looked at me and he said, you know something, I get far more out of sitting at home and reading the Bible on my own than going to that meeting. And you know what he was saying? That preacher couldn't teach me anything. I wouldn't get any blessing out of sitting under somebody else's teaching, so I'll just sit home and do it myself. Friend, that's a very serious attitude. In James chapter 1, 21, we're told to receive the word of God with meekness. My friend, if the preacher is preaching out of the book and is faithful to the word of God, it's not the preacher that you obey or disobey. It's the Lord. Whoever the vessel that brings the word, you're accountable before God. How sad whenever we have an attitude, I know better than God. How sad when we disobey God's word and explain it away in our heart and rationalize it and Feel comfortable about it. Friend, those are, that's dangerous ground. That's very dangerous ground. We need to be humble enough to say, well, the Lord tells me I must come under the teaching of the word of God. I'm going to humble myself and do that. The Lord tells me to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to do that. The Lord tells me to put sin away from before my eyes. I'm going to humble myself before the Lord and do that because I know that if I go against God, and I'm not meek but filled with pride, there is going to be consequences. And there's three things I just want to say about pride, and then we're going to move down through the rest of this passage. Turn with me to Proverbs and the chapter number six. There's three simple things I want to teach you about pride this morning. Proverbs chapter six. Verses 16 to 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false report or witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Oh, I don't like lies. Of course the Lord hates that. I don't like murder. Of course, the Lord hates that. Oh, those who sow discord among God's people. Of course, the Lord hates that, and so do I. But look at the first one, a proud look. Friend, the Lord hates it. The Lord hates it. You need to humble yourself before the Lord. You need to humble yourself and realize that you're nothing but a sinner saved by the grace of God. You are no better. I'm no better than any other believer. And our duty is to keep humble before the Lord, to seek to be faithful to him in the strength of his Holy Spirit that our lives might be useful for eternity and not be a burden or a discouragement in the work of God. Look at Proverbs chapter 8 and verse number 13. And it says there, the fear of the Lord. And that means the respect and the reverence of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I 
hate. So here is the instruction of wisdom. If we're to fear the Lord, and that means to reverence God, we must hate pride. We must not tolerate it in any shape or form in our lives. And naturally, we're proud people. We do something, we want to tell other people about it. But the word of God tells us that we are to hate it. Why? Well, this is my third point about pride. We thought the Lord hates pride. We should hate pride. Thirdly, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Now, not just maybe immediately, maybe not within hours or days, but shame's coming if you're going to walk in pride. Friend, if you'd seek to disobey God's word in pride saying, I know better, I can prosper without obeying what God has told me to do, shame is going to come upon you. Your heart is going to be filled with shame and embarrassment and with regret because the Lord's going to put his finger on that thing in your life that is displeasing to him. Another reason about, or another thing considering pride is awful consequences, turn over to chapter 13 uh, and verse number 10. Chapter 13, verse number 10. Only by pride cometh contention. Only by pride cometh contention. What does the word contention mean? Quarrels or strife. Why do arguments start? Because of pride. Why do quarrels come into being? Because of pride. Why does contention come in personal lives, in relationships, in church life? Why do these things happen? Because of pride. Do you see how wicked pride is? Do you see how destructive pride is? Do you see how abhorrent it is in the sight of the Lord? Do you see how we need to put into our daily prayers a clause where we pray, Lord, keep me humble. And therefore, I urge God's people, keep humble and meek in thoughts of self. Whatever you are today, in a positive sense, you are by the grace of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. But also keep humble in response to God's word. Friend, don't come out of a church service thinking, <laughs> Who does he think he is telling me this or telling me that? Look at what God's word says. And realize that the author is the Holy Spirit. And be humble enough to say, well, if this is what God says, this is what I must do. Also be humble in your conduct with others. Be humble. Listen. Listen to what others have to say. Sometimes, you know, people are very good at talking, but they're not very good at listening. And even whenever you get a word in edgeways, they're actually not listening to you at all. They're thinking about the next thing they're going to say. Humble yourself and listen to others. Humble yourself and be kind to others. Humble yourself and help others. Humble yourself and pray for others. Friend, humble yourself and go and reach others who are not saved. Because if we're honest... The one thing that keeps us from going to ask our family members, our neighbors, our friends out to gospel meetings is pride. It's not that we don't believe they're in danger and on their way to hell. It's not that we're not concerned about it. It's not that we don't know the gospel, but it's pride. What will they think of me? Oh, may the Lord make us a meek people who will humble ourselves to do these things. Now, these verses teach us in Psalm 25 that the Lord will and can teach and guide those who are meek. Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan, said, the Lord will teach the humble his secrets. He will not teach proud scholars. Do you notice the progression there in verse 8? Therefore, will he teach sinners in the way, so he'll bring them into the way of salvation. And then he will... The meek he will teach in judgment, the saints he will guide in judgment, and the saints he will teach his way. So there's that progression, isn't there? To teach or to give judgment or to guide in judgment means the Lord will decide what is right and what is wrong. Sometimes we're brought before deliberations and we have to make a decision. Is this right or is this wrong? Will I go here or will I not go here? Will I do this or will I not do this? 
God is willing to guide you in each decision you have to make. And therefore, if you find yourself in a situation where it's not automatically clear or black and white in your mind, if something is right or wrong, pray and ask God to give you that wisdom. To either give you a, an unsettled spirit to know what's wrong or a peace within your heart to know what's right. And let God be the guide. And friend, you'll not go wrong. Notice that he'll also teach the saints in his way or the meek in his way. And that reminds us God has a plan for you. I'm so glad this morning that God has a plan for me. He's a plan for your life. He will teach us in that way. And therefore, what do we need to do to know that plan? We need to ask him. Have you ever asked the Lord for his will for your life? Have you ever asked the Lord in recent days, are you where you ought to be? Or is there something the Lord would have you do to go a little bit further with him in obedience? Not only do you ask the Lord, you wait upon the Lord. Don't run ahead of God. Don't make decisions without first seeking him and waiting to see his will revealed. And then when God reveals his will, obey it. Now it's interesting to note in verse number 10, it says, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. The word mercy means kind or kindness. And the word truth means faithfulness. So God's ways are kind ways. There are ways of faithfulness where he is faithful to his people. But notice the clause, it's the paths of the Lord. Because there are many different ways in this life we can take. There are many different routes and there are many different uh, ways we can live our life. But only the ways of the Lord are mercy and truth. Friend, the other ways that are contrary to the word of God are not ways of kindness. They're ways of cruelty. Oh, they might feel good for a little while, but I tell you, at the end, they will bite. At the end, they will sting. At the end, there will be destruction. Friend, any other way that goes against the way of the Lord is not a way of truth. It's a way of lies. And you ought to keep away from every other way other than the ways of the Lord. But you'll notice what this verse is teaching us. It says, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto a certain type of people, to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Now, the word covenant in this instance means the law of God or the commands of God. The word testimony, it means the scriptures. So therefore, what it's saying is, the people who believe that God's ways are mercy and truth, kindness and faithfulness, are those who are obedient to the Lord's commands and those who are people of the word of God. And is that not true? The happy, joyful, growing believer is the one who's obedient to the Lord. That's where our joy is found, in obedience to the Lord. But I'll tell you, you start walking contrary to the word of God. And you start to think of the ways of the Lord. Oh, that's hard. That's too difficult. That's too far. I'm not going to be extreme. I'll just go a little bit. I'll not go the whole way the scripture tells me to go. Friend, you're walking in disobedience to the Lord. Yes, it's partial disobedience, but partial disobedience is disobedience. And if that's the case, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're following after some foolish lie that you can go another way and prosper. It is not a way of kindness. It's not a way of mercy. It's going to cost you. It's going to hurt you. And therefore, be in obedience to the word of God. If you find yourself out of step with God's word, never think that God's word's too severe or, or too far. You're wrong. And you need to be changed and your heart needs to be changed because it's always a blessing to walk with God. It's always a blessing to walk with God. The most joyful believer in this world today is the one who's walking with God. And you ask that person who's rejoicing in the Lord, what do you think of the word of God and the ways of God? Oh, their ways of kindness, their ways of mercy, their ways of truth, their ways of faithfulness. And I love the ways of the Lord. You ask someone who's backslidden or not where they ought to be, well, what do you think about the things of God and the ways of God? Well, how long did I tell you about so-and-so in my church? How long did I tell you about the preacher? How long did I tell you about my denomination? And they'll go off and complain about everything. Why? Because they know they're contrary to the ways of God. There's a lovely song that says, It is glory just to walk with him whose blood has ransomed me. It is rapture for my soul each day. It is joy divine to feel him near. 
Where'er my path may be, bless the Lord, its glory all the way. He will guide my steps aright, through the veil and o'er the height. It is glory just to walk with him. And so it is. It's glory. You look back, dear Christian, at the times in your life when you were on the mountaintop, whenever you were rejoicing in the Lord, when the blessing of the Lord was so much, you even just wept for joy. Where was the glory? Why did you feel that way? Why were you knowing the great blessing of the Lord? Because you were surrendered. You were where God called you to be. You were in obedience and you were in blessing. I challenge you today. I challenge my heart. Are you walking with him? Are you walking in his paths? Where will your steps lead you to? Will they lead you closer to him? Or will they lead you farther from God? Does your walk bless the Lord? Or does it grieve him? And what happens in verses number 11 and 12? with such thoughts about the goodness of God and the paths of God and the blessings for the meek, the psalmist can go no further in his thoughts and his writings until he has repented of his waywardness. In verse 11, and stated the truth about the blessing of God in verse number 12. Look what it says, verse 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. This man was a saved man. And as the word of God came to his heart by the Holy Spirit, he had to stop right there and right then and say, Lord, for thy name's sake, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. Friend, you don't have to wait to the end of the meeting to call on the Lord to forgive you. You don't have to wait until the final amen before you say, Lord, pardon mine iniquity where you're sitting at in this church this morning, dear child of God, if there's things in your life that are displeasing to the Lord, call out now within your heart, Lord, for thy name's sake, that I'll not bring shame to you, Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it's great, I feel it. He maybe didn't feel it as he came to the start of the psalm, as he started to uh, go through these thoughts, but as the word of God came into his heart, the Holy Spirit put something upon, or put a finger upon his sin, and he prayed that the Lord forgive him. And having done that, he says, What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the ways that he shall choose. And you know, the Lord will choose for us the best way. Leave the choice to him in every aspect of your life and he will lead you and guide you right. Verses 13 and 14, we're almost through. Here we have the privileges for those who walk with God and obey his word. These are the privileges we enjoy when we're meek, when we're fearing the Lord, when we're saved. Verse number 13, his soul shall dwell at ease. This is speaking of peace. When you walk with God, there's peace. You know when you do something wrong as a Christian and you go against God's word, you know there is that thing niggling down within you. What is that? That is the Lord dealing with your heart. Friend, if you cannot sit before God this morning with a perfect peace as a believer, well, then you need to pray that the Lord will forgive whatever sin is hindering that. Because there's peace, perfect peace. In this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus gives us peace within. Not only is there peace, there's prosperity. It says in verse 13, and his seed shall inherit the earth. Now, when we speak about uh, this prosperity. There is this wonderful picture of his offspring being blessed by the fruit of the earth. And you know, there is the teaching in scripture that if we live in a spiritual way, we will be blessed physically. Now, I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel where you're guaranteed perfect health all your life or millions in the bank because of your strong faith. That is not what I'm talking about. But there is a blessing Physical blessing, practical blessing when you're obedient to the Lord. So let me give you an example. If you obey the Lord and you abstain from alcohol, well, then you've the blessing of not having to go and make up with those you've fallen out with when you were drunk, of not making a fool of yourself, of not having a home where alcohol is causing heartache, not having to wake up in the morning with a hangover and all of those things, not doing silly things under the influence of drink. So there are blessings when you obey God. 
Whenever you obey uh, the word of God in regards to money and that tells us to prepare for the future and to store up for ahead and to give our tithe onto the work of God and our offerings onto the Lord, when we do that, we will find that we will be blessed in that department. We're not wasting it on sinful things or foolish things, but the Lord will bless us in that way. The money that we have earned by the sweat of our brow that we'll be able to use. We're not wasting it in alcohol or drugs or things like that. So there are those things. But of course, there is a spiritual prosperity that God always gives and blesses his people with. And part of that is found in verse number 14. It says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. He will show them his covenant. So we have peace, we have prosperity. And thirdly, precious revelations. Now, the word secret is a very interesting word. In the original Hebrew, it doesn't mean something unknown. However, it does mean something that's not known by everybody, but something that people can enter into. In fact, the word secret could be translated in the company of people, in a session of people. It is the idea of a small group of people coming together that know one another, that are friendly, and there's an idea of intimacy here. And friend, that is what is speaking here of the secret. It could be translated the friendship of the Lord. The friendship of the Lord is with them that fear him. That closeness, that intimacy, that growing in the knowledge of God, that coming into his presence and speaking friend with friend. For those who fear God, that's their right and their privilege. And the child of God who's walking with the Lord will say, there's no friend to me like Jesus. Isn't it wonderful to be able to come into the Lord's presence? Nothing between us and him. Come to the friend that sticketh closer than a brother and to hear his word and hear his blessing to our soul. He will show them his covenant. He will show them his truth. He will reveal more of what he has done for them. He'll reveal more of how he loves them. He'll reveal more of what he's provided for them. Oh, the Lord will teach us greater things, but we have to come in meekness and in reverence with the fear of the Lord. And therefore, my challenge to you, dear believer, before you come to God's house tonight, get you before God. I pray the Lord will give you a humble spirit with a meekness to receive the truth and to be blessed by it. Pray the Lord will give you his, the fear of the Lord, the reverence, the respect for God. Because I'll tell you, if you prepare your heart to come into the presence of God and into the place of worship, you will leave rejoicing. But if you've come in half-heartedly, arrogantly, with an issue with someone else that you haven't dealt with, unconfessed sin, prayed. Friend, you'll not get out of the service what you could. And therefore, the importance of keeping our heart right before a holy God. As we close this morning, my question is this, are you in the way of God? Do you fear him? Are you humble before him? Dear believer, make sure that you're leaving in the center of his will. He will choose the way for you. He will bless you richly. He'll give you that peace that only God can give. And dear friend, if you're not saved this morning, this God can do the same for you, what he's done for many in this gathering. He can save you. He can lead you. He can be the friend that sticketh closer than the brother, the friend that died to save you, the friend that shed his blood, the one who has truly your best interest at heart. And praise God, he's ready and willing and able to save. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn, 431. That hymn says, Guide me, O thy great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. We'll sing, stand, sing this together, and then we will have our closing prayer.
Let's stand and worship God. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful this morning for what we've learned in thy precious word and how we've been reminded that, Lord, there is that call to holy living and that call to meekness, Lord, root out pride out of our hearts. And we realize, Lord, that is something we have to pray on a daily basis. Times, Lord, we get, uh, we get ahead of ourselves. Times, Lord, we get caught away with the importance of self. And, oh, Lord, we are proud before thee grieving thy heart. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll give us a humble, meek spirit, that we will be obedient to thee, we will walk before thee well. Lord, we'll be humble enough to confess our need of thee. We'll be humble enough to pray. We'll be humble enough to come and worship thee because you've told us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We'll be humble enough to know that God's ways are truth, and mercy, and we will be blessed if we walk in them. Oh, Lord, I pray, keep us humble and help us, Lord, to walk faithfully before thee and this world in the week that lies ahead, should you spare and tarry. I do also pray, Lord, if there's any in this gathering not yet see you, that you'll give them grace to humble themselves and to call on the Lord for salvation. Lord, we're so glad that we've not been asked to do these things in of ourselves, but to look to the Lord, for salvation belongeth unto him. Save, we pray. Give joy, we pray, within the hearts of thy people, and victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil, as we seek to live for thee. In Jesus' precious name we ask these things, and for his glory alone. Amen. <laughs>